Good morning. Exodus 17. Exodus 17. Exodus 17. We'll begin in verse 1. The whole Israelite community set out from the desert of sin, traveling from place to place as the Lord commanded. And when they came to Rephidim, there was no water for the people to drink. So they quarreled with Moses, and they said, Give us water to drink. Moses said, Why do you quarrel with me? Why do you put the Lord to the test? But the people were thirsty, for there was no water there. And they grumbled against Moses, and they said, Why did you... Bring us up out of Egypt to make us and our children and our livestock die of thirst. So Moses cried out to the Lord, What am I going to do with these people? They are almost ready to stone me. So the Lord answered Moses, Walk on ahead of the people. Take with you some of the elders of Israel, and take in your hand that staff with which you struck the Nile, and go. I will stand there before you by the rock at Horeb. Strike the rock, and water will come out of it for the people to drink. So Moses did this in the sight of the elders of Israel. He called the place Massa and Meribah because the Israelites quarreled, because they tested the Lord, saying, Is the Lord among us or not? Let's review for the sake of context. Israel has been in Egypt for 400 years. Most of that time in slavery. God hears their cry, sends their deliverer, Moses. Moses gets there, and with this staff that God has taken and made into an instrument of his fingerprint. Moses does the incredible. Locusts so heavy, they cover the ground, devouring every green thing in the land of Egypt. Darkness so dark that it could be felt. Death of the firstborn. As those people are finally sent on their way, there is a cloud that accompanies them. A cloud of, of light, if you will, what we would be accustomed to seeing in the daytime and, and, and of a fiery look in the eve. It has just been a short time that the people in chapter 15 were singing praises to God and glorifying His magnificent name. And then at the end of 15, God says, If you will listen carefully to the voice of the Lord your God and do what is right in His eyes, if you will pay attention to his commands and keep his decrees, then all things are going to go well and nothing bad is going to happen to you. 
But in 16 and verse number 2, in the desert, the whole community grumbled against Moses and Aaron. The Israelites said, oh, if only we had died by the Lord's hand in Egypt. There we sat around pots of meat and we ate food that we wanted. But you brought us into the desert to starve the entire assembly to death. Moses replies, who are we, in verse 7, who are we that you should grumble against us? Again, at the end of verse 8, he says, who are we? You are not grumbling against us. You are grumbling against God. So he's trying to educate the people. He's trying to get them on the page that they need to be, that their faith should really be talking through their actions as well as their lips. Uh, verse number 20, there is instruction that is given about manna. However, some of them paid no attention. And they kept a part of it until morning, which was against what Moses has said. It was full of maggots and began to smell, so Moses was angry with them. Again in 27, more instructions are given. Nevertheless, some of the people went out on the seventh day to gather it, even though Moses had already said something different. In 28, he said, How long will you refuse to keep my commands and listen to my instructions? And now we come to 17. It is clear at this point that God is with his people. He has delivered them out of the hand of this Egyptian pharaoh, brought them across a body of water where he took the water and turned it into dry land. He swallowed up the Egyptian army. His presence was signaled day and night. He turned waters that were bitter into waters that were sweet. All right, so now they get to the edge of this place. And they are thirsty. So here's what I want you to do. I want you to take two or three things out of this passage. Here's the first thing. Trust God rather than what you know. Trust God rather than what you... These people came to the edge of the, the place and they said, hey, hey, hey. Wait a minute, we have got a major problem here. And I tell you what the problem is, there's no water here. We can take a look around and see that this is not a place where you're going to find water. We're in serious trouble, Moses. We know, we know that without water, we're not going to make it. They are so confident of what they know. Don't we sometimes find ourselves in that same exact Place where we are so confident that we know what we need for me, what I need for me. I am absolutely positively sure that I know what is good for me. Not only am I positively sure about that, 99% of the time I think I'm right. As I survey what I need, as I look at what I know, generally I am not questioning whether or not I am right. I am stomping my foot to convince someone else. The people knew, they knew that there was no way that water was going to be found. They just knew it. But the reality is, is that what they knew wasn't really true. 
They did know that they were thirsty. They did know that this was an arid place. They did know that maybe they're looking around and sending out a scout crew and they can't find even as much as a stream. But they forgot about trust. They forgot that their God is capable of taking a rock and making it into a spigot. See, they didn't think about that. They didn't consider that God's power would be the way for them to find relief to what they really needed. They really needed to see that they needed to look to God in their matter rather than look to themselves. And that's what God is trying to teach them. And perhaps it is in your life when you look at decisions that you have absolutely known. You've made those decisions, and you know good and well if you play it out, you have gotten to the end of those decisions, and at some point you've been able to look back and say, you know what, I have made many decisions that I just knew were right. I knew that this was the only thing that was conceivable at that time, and I made that decision, and it was wrong. And had I trusted God, then things would have turned out this way. Had I listened, had I looked to God, then perhaps my grief and anxiety, my path would have been totally different. God is looking for you to trust. Trust in the Lord. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. And don't lean on your own, on your own understanding. That's the scripture. That's the idea that God is trying to teach here in the desert. And God masterfully, masterfully is leading his people to this place. Trust me. Trust me. It's so easy for us to feel like we know what is right for me, right on that second. I know what I need. I know what I want. After all, I'm thirsty. I've got this itch, and it's got to be scratched, and it's got to be scratched right now. I have had five kids, and they've all come through the door at some point in the time, uh, in the summertime, and, and yours did this too. You know, if I don't get a drink, I'm going to die. Well, there were some days that I tested that. It doesn't work. Uh, they, they don't actually die in spite of what they say. And when they come in and they're dying of sweat and they're dripping and they're drenched and they're, they're about to choke, you know, because they are dying for a drink. They're not actually dying for a drink. What is happening is, is that they're their focus on what they need overwhelms reality. That's what we do. Same exact thing. How many times are you saying to God, I'm about to die if you don't get me something to drink? Man, trust God is able to assess what you need. Trust that. You live with a good, gracious, compassionate, merciful, loving God who has invited you into fellowship with Him. Whereas Jesus teaches you that you can call to Him as Father. Stop trying to feel like you know what's right, what you need. You need it right now. You know what you need. Trust. God. Trust God. All right, here's the second thing. Mm, this is really good. There's a little surprise here. Trust God. That's the first thing. Secondarily, thank God. Well, the people are thirsty, verse 3, and they're grumbling. Verse 4, Moses cries out, what are you going to do? I don't know what to do with them. So God says, I know what to do with them. The Lord answered Moses, walk on ahead of the people. Take some elders and take the staff. And 
I will stand there before you at the rock of Horeb. And strike the rock. There's an interesting idea that's found in here. I chose the word thanks uh, because really and truly in this, it, this is a surprise. There was not a single Israelite at that moment that was expecting water to gush out of a rock. No way, no how. It just doesn't come to mind naturally. Had all those people been polled to survey, what do you think the most likely thing uh, to solve this problem? Most of them would have said, we need to find a little creek somewhere. And God says, wait, 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 wait. Wait, wait, wait. Let me, let me blow your mind. Let me let water come out of a rock. A place you would never find. Gushing water in the middle of a dry place. See, God is full of incredible surprises where He is thinking about you before you even were aware that He has thought about you. Isn't that incredible? All these people, before they ever got thirsty, God already knew that there would be a rock and that rock would be struck and that it would provide water for Israel. All right, now, just hold your finger there and let's turn over to 1 Corinthians 10 and verse 4. 1 Corinthians 10... And I want us to look very carefully. I'm so glad that this dialogue is recorded for us because it opens up a little bit of a, of, of a further understanding. And there's a hint more that God is doing in this episode with the rock that I want you to see. This is how surprising and full of surprises your God is. Uh, let's just start at verse 1. I don't want you to be ignorant of the fact, brothers, that our forefathers were all under the cloud. They passed through the sea. He's talking about the, the very people that we're reading about. They all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. They ate the same spiritual food. Look, and they drank the same spiritual drink. Watch. For they drank... They drank from the spiritual rock that accompanied them, and that rock was Christ. Okay, I don't understand what all that fully means, but this much it seems to suggest that when Jesus talked about himself, remember over and over, he, re he referred to himself as living water. Ha, the woman at the well, remember? Okay, it, you don't have to drink from this well. You can be filled with living water. John 7, the same thing. He said, I'm going to make it possible so that all you thirsty people can have living water. He is the rock. Figuratively, he is that physical rock that Moses struck where there was water gushing to satisfy the needs of the people. But it's a little deeper even than that. Because Moses is told to strike the rock. God comes down. He stands there aside that rock. And he says, go Moses, when I tell you, strike that rock. And it's a picture. It's a picture of the death that Jesus would die for his own people in order to provide them the living sustenance that God intends for them to have. It's a picture within a picture. And it demonstrates God's grace. Now, I want you to understand something about your God, okay? 
uh, if I chose one of our sweet women over 70 years old and brought her up here and slapped her in the face, your impression of me would be changed immediately. And in all sincerity, the most of you sitting in this room would struggle to ever, listen to me, to ever have a right concept of me again. I want you to know God doesn't find human behavior what controls him. Even though you would be very angry at me. God may be angry at me for doing that, but here is what God would be right after I smacked my beloved sister. He would be unmoved. He would want me to be saved just as much as ever just as much as before I took and applied a lick to the woman. See, God is not changed by your behavior. That's what I want you to understand. Your decision does not manipulate God. There may be consequences that God brings upon you for your decisions, etc. But your behavior does not change the nature, character, and quality of God. When God says, I loved the world, he doesn't say, I love everybody except people who murder. Now them, I, can't, I just can't love them. When God said that he decided that he would redeem the world, oh, oh, all those who are not those that mess with small children. That's not his exception clause. There's nothing. There's nothing. Nothing that changes God's behavior. These people, they come to this rock, they deserve beating. They are filled with ingratitude. They don't recognize that God is with them. They mouth off. They are not content. They are not trusting. They are not happy. They are not obedient. They are not listening to the voice of God. And God is saying, wait, wait, wait. I want you to be my children. Yes, I do. I want you to be my children. That's how God feels. And that's what God did for you. That's why Paul says in Romans 5, when we were still sinners. See, God didn't have, well, as long as I have a good feeling about you, then I'll send Jesus for you. No, he didn't. I have a good feeling about everybody. The sinners, all of them. Who is that? That's all of us. And he comes down here in this moment and he, he gives this image of grace. I'm going to go down and give them more than they deserve. I'm going to give them something that's going to surprise them. Water out of a rock. Who would have thought that I would have done that? They're here and they are testing me. But I am going to do what they don't expect. You see, that makes me want to trust that God all the more. To know that about Him. To understand that about Him. He didn't change His mind to send the Christ because He knew that I would be a creep. He didn't do that. And He never will. That is a gracious God. All right, here's the last thing. Trust God and thank God. Here's the last thing. Turn to God. 
Look at the end here. All right, so Moses does this, and everybody drinks. Now, if you know anything about reading your Bible, you will know that naming a place is a big deal, okay? Nobody's name is given arbitrarily or just haphazardly. Names are picked for a reason. There's all kind of God significance that's put inside of a man's name or a woman's name. Now, here's what they named the place. The mountain where God gave us all the water. <laughs> mm. The mountain where God quenched our thirst. Mount Gatorade. <laughs> no, they didn't name it that. They didn't name it Mount Gatorade. And do you know why they didn't name it Mount Gatorade? Here's, here's why. Let me, let me end with this, but just follow with me. There is really and truly a principle that you find in the New Testament. It is the idea of sanctification. Sanctification is this idea that God is wanting you in your spiritual life, in your walk with Him, not only for you, for your behavior, to be pursuing those things that are of God, but for your behavior to be manifesting the, the fact that you have been with God. Remember how Moses' face was, was all shiny and bright when he went up and then slowly it died away, okay? God wants sanctification. He wants that process to be ongoing. So here's what he does in this passage. Moses calls the place, listen, exactly what it is. It's the place where you grumble. It's the place where you tested God. That's what we're going to call this place. The place where you showed up and your heart wouldn't trust. The place where you disobeyed. Mm. See, our tendency is to name it, well, the, the place where I may have possibly had a bad day for just a few minutes. And see, we gloss it over. And we make it a little prettier. And we'll take what is sin in, in front of God's eyes and, and we'll make it justified based on some excuse that I am offering. This is the, yes, I know it's a mountain, but this is the mountain of uh, if you hadn't have done this, then I wouldn't have acted like that. What? And we'll go out of our way to name it something that's a little more casual, a little easier to deal with. Moses names it exactly what it is. He says, this is the day you didn't trust. This is the day you spit in God's face. I want you to remember that. Involved in sanctification is me seeing through God's eye what sin looks like. And when I see what sin really looks like through God's eye, when I recognize, ooh, that stinks. When I see, ouch, that burns. When I see, whoa, that was poison. When I stop playing around with it, then you have your eyes open to those things. And you can see exactly what it is. And when you see exactly what it is, you are more likely to move away from that thing. You see, sincerely, who's motivated by uh, the, the, the amount of, you know, I was made to do it? Nobody's motivated by that. Because we're throwing off our issue onto somebody or something else. God wants in your life. He, he wants you to see Him just like these people. as holy. I believe I believe that if you see God, 
if you, in your personal life, if you see God as becoming more of a holy thing in your life, it will prevent you from building up little names on mountains that aren't really what they are. What does God look like to you? Is God, is your God more holy? in your walk with Him. If God is not more holy, surely, 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 okay? Surely you don't have the full idea of God's holiness and how holy He is. Okay? It would be impossible for a human to claim, yes, I fully comprehend how holy God is. I get it. Well, if you claim that, I'll be happy to listen. But I think in our limited way of humanity, we're we're unable to fully grasp just how holy God is. But, but, that doesn't mean that your understanding of who God is doesn't change or shouldn't change or isn't being changed constantly. So what does God look like to you? I'm going to tell you, if you feel like these Israelites, God was wanting them to move forward past that. Call it what it is. It's sin. You didn't trust me. You should have. You did what you wanted. You thought about how you wanted. You should have trusted me. Because I am here. I am gracious. I'm a provider. I'm a provider in secret ways. I'm a provider in pictures. I'm a provider of the legitimate thing. I'm a provider of the spiritual, the, the, the spiritual water. I'm a provider of everything for you. Am I in it? Of course I'm in it. I've been in it before you were even born. I was in it before you were even thought of. Of course I'm in it. I'm your father. Trust me. Trust me. If we ask, God and Christ Jesus will come and make their home with us. Mm. What a blessed promise that is. This morning, if you are ready to respond to this holy God who is so filled with grace and so desires mercy to be extended through Christ, then you can come. And if for whatever reason, you're looking for our prayers or to find God in greater proximity of your life, we'll be happy to pray with you and for you.